Well, uh, Torben has presented to me a, a one that takes a cake. And it is my pleasure to read the following bio. Torben Kling Peterson from Seagate. Uh, he's a princ principal engineer at Seagate. When he's not solving the biggest storage problems the universe can dish out, he plays golf badly, guitar decently, or samples one of his many, many scotch malt whiskeys he's collected over the years and reminisces about a day of yore when his people went out to ravage the coastlines of Europe because Torben is a Viking. <laughs> Torben Kling Peterson, please uh, approach the podium and please don't ravage me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Well, I had to come up with something a little bit better than last year because last year he had my formal bio, which unfortunately included my academic title, and he ran that into the ground and then some. So I definitely want to. <laughs> so, anyway, <which way, clears throat> um, I think this is it, right? Yeah. So, we're going to talk about lustre monitoring. Um, other people have already talked about lustre monitoring today, which I think is great because it is a very in my mind, important thing to do. But we want to approach lustre monitoring a little bit differently. In addition to having the performance metrics, which is all important, we think that we should see a lustre file system as a whole, as a combination of not just the software running lustre, but all the components of that system because that is my storage file system and everything comes into play. So in addition to the uh, performance data, we're looking at health data as well over time, how parameters change, how different things will modify over time, etc. how the actual hardware systems change over time as well. We think that statistics on those things can have a very big impact on performance metrics and how they change, as well as the client side of things. So the approach we've done is to look at it more from how do you collect data, how do you actually store those data, and how do you dish it out to users. Now, there are a lot of different ways of visualizing data, and we've tried to come up with a solution that kind of fits everybody rather than having one size fits all. So, you've all seen this before, LMT. Now, LMT has been great. I've been using it in systems for the last seven or eight years, ever since LMT1, which had its flaws, I can say, but LMT3 is good. It works. Now, it has a few drawbacks that we want to address a little bit. And some of those drawbacks is around the fact that it's becoming a little bit archaic. It's still based on Java. Not everybody likes Java. There is problems with Java. Secondly, even though Lawrence Livermore did an excellent work bringing this to the market and, and su supporting it over time, as far as I understand, there is no continuous development. There will be no continued support of that tool. So for all intents and purposes, that tool is at the end of its life. That doesn't mean it's not valuable. It does not mean it cannot fulfill what it was designed to do. And I think it still has a lot of life in it for solutions. But with the advent of Lustre 2.5, some of the new features such as DNE, it doesn't do DNE. It cannot see more than one metadata server. Obviously a drawback. And some of our customers are very interested in monitoring the entire solution. Now, we're trying to do something that works from, from a single OSS system all the way up to the largest system that are being built. And as you saw yesterday from Peter's presentation, some of the systems that have now been delivered as we speak and some of the systems that will be delivered over the next year or so are humongous compared to what we've done to date. And it, we need a tool that keeps up with that. So our approach is try to something that f fulfills the same, I would say the same idea as LMT did originally, but can scale and go way beyond that. So <clears throat> we've tried to focus on the data acquisition instead of just the 
visualization of those data. We've tried to look at how we can do things automatically without having to install too many clients or install too many different components in the system or have something that runs really well uh, without management, a self-discovery of the system. More importantly, we also wanted to make sure that getting data out of that data repository is simple that is easy to get access to it. So we're also developing an API that will allow you to interface with this in a very seamless manner going forward. And we think that is another very interesting component. And as I said earlier, or I said earlier, we think that there are so many good visualizations tool on the market today, open source and otherwise, that actually can benefit from extracting these data. And people want to build their own view because they have different interests of their own systems, they have different requirements, and we need to find something that can actually fulfill all of these. So, <coughs> this is a very crude representation of what we are trying to do at the moment, where we have a data collection system, uh, full HA capable obviously, because we want to make sure that we can keep those data in a decent fashion, but also a RESTful API for exporting these in a simple fashion, so that you can use an external server system and external mechanisms, even remotely, for storing larger amount of, of time data, but also visualize it differently, rather than having a one system fits all. So, we looked at that a little bit and looked at some of the problems that have already been outlined. One of the biggest problems is that if you collect all the data of a system and you try to save that data over time, you will end up with some fairly large files, extremely large files. And using that data can be really cumbersome at times, mainly because in the old system, you pushed every single data, every five seconds to a system that stored these data and it just grew and grew. We wanted to look at how can you minimize that data traffic, mainly because you don't want to saturate a management network just with monitoring data. Secondly, we also want to make sure that only data that actually changes significantly is recorded. So we push delta from the client sides up to the server instead of the other way around. Rather than pulling every data up, we push changes, deltas. We think that is the better way of doing things. And <clears throat> again, we tested this at some storage servers, and one of the things we found, for instance, that a system like the one at DKRZ, which is our biggest part, our big partner in this project, um, Peter mentioned that that's a German climatology center that just installed a, a 20 petabyte file system growing to 50, 50 petabytes within the next 12 months. Uh, it's based on a bull system, so it has a lot of computers, about three petaflops currently, uh, and it will continue to grow as time goes on. We need a tool that can keep up with that as well. Now, we've talked with these guys, we've worked with these guys to figure out what do they really want out of that system. At the moment, we tested it to do about 20,000 samples per second, almost a million metrics out of that system. And when we do that, we currently consume about 1.7% uh, of a gigabit bandwidth. We did the same test with LMT, and we consumed 20% of that bandwidth because there's a difference between the pull and the push. And we think that's a big difference going forward to be able to scale to true exascale systems. <coughs> we also do use different types of collectors, but I'll get to that in this eye chart. So, the code concept is that, and just to give you an idea, this is actually the storage platform. This is the hardware platform, and this is the OSS system that's running with a small set of agents, really unobtrusive in the system, that will allow us to collect every data, not just luster data, but as you can see, disk monitoring data, uh, open HPI data, smart disk data, etc. Environmentalists, what have you. Because we, we think all of these data is relevant in a large system. Uh, I will focus on, on the actual performance data uh, of this package. But the whole idea is that this is a very scalable process. We can scale it to almost any size, we believe. And by storing everything in an optimized MySQL database, now there are all the choices out there today, but we still think that that is <coughs> something that works really well in large scales. We can then extract data into a GUI, command line, what have you, depending on the needs. And then the export feature out of this is based on actually extracting data from the database rather than doing it from the live system. 
So the data collection was interesting because we talked to DKRZ and about what do they actually want to measure. We gave them a blank piece of paper and they start filling in the performance metrics they wanted. Interesting enough, they came up with almost an exact list of what LMT does today, so obviously the original LMT was spot on, and we think that's kind of an interesting thing. The timing's a little bit different because some of the things that the LMT collects uh, doesn't change that much over time. So collecting the same number every five seconds when it doesn't change for an hour is kind of you know, unnecessary. So that's one of the things we've changed. Uh, you can see the numbers here, but I, I changed it into another graph. So these are the actual parameters we sample from a luster performance. And that goes for the OSSs and the MDSs and, and those values. And again, when we say MDS in this case, it's full DNE capable as well. And the timings we use, again, a data is only updated if it has significantly changed. Again, we push data. So even though the standard sampling is five seconds, not every data is committed to the database because there's no need to do it. So this is what the tool looks like. Um, and and we, 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 are, we are unfortunately very unimaginative people, so we call it LTOP, um, which is uh, homage, I would say, to the original tools, but that is our main tool. But we also have tools, as you can see, for fetching data out of the system. And this can be done from the server at any given time so that you can extract an old time sample. And our idea of samples is we want to keep performance data indefinitely. I actually want to be able to pull out a set of performance data that was done when we ran a benchmark three years ago and compare it to benchmark we're running today to make sure that things are behaving similarly, that there's no big change in the system. And again, it comes to doing analytics on a large system and how it actually changes over time. Because if a Lustre file system, even if you don't update the source code or anything on it, if it's the same file system, it will still change it w the way it works over time. We think that's important. The other thing we do is we have some other features that we think is interesting. The one I specifically want to highlight a little bit is the filter mechanisms, and I'll show you some examples of that in a second. Now, the idea about that is that if you do a command line tool, you have a large system with, let's say, 50, 60, 100, 200 OSTs, and you try to list everything on a screen, that screen ain't big enough, not by any means. So we want to be able to be able to tra extract data and only the data we want. I haven't gotten the development team to really do everything I want yet because I wanted to be able to say an OST pool. I just want to look at an OST pool or a DNE pool or something else. But I can get a far bit with a little bit of intelligent scripting here. So if I actually go into the system and do a fetch, I have to use, unfortunately, a fairly cumbersome timeline because it needs to match the timestamp we have in the MySQL database. Um, and in this case, you can see we try to extract a year's worth of data of the system. <coughs> Now, a year's worth of data is how much? Well, that was kind of what I wanted to do here. So you actually see that it, it ran out of this quota after about six months of data. Now, that's 10 gigabytes of data because that's what we set the disk quota to. So a year is roughly a, 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 a 20 gigabytes of data. Now, you hear other people saying that three months of data is a terabyte. Well, if you record every number, even though it doesn't change, that is the numbers you come up with. We think that this changes the way we actually display data. The other thing we did, uh, which I think is kind of cool, is that even though we only did a partial fetch, it didn't crash on us. It actually saved that file, told us that if we actually want to get the rest of that year, those are the numbers we should use. So that's what I did on the next slide. I took the rest of the years. Now, it creates two files. But still, it's a continuous file that I can use. Now, these files are formatted in JSON format so that it's easy to extract data into any standard tools. JSON is a very simple format for handling large amounts of data, and it's easy to export it to other tools. So that is the definition we did at this point in time. Now, just to give you some idea about DKRZ, and unfortunately, none of the people from DKRZ could be here to cover their own bit and their input on in this, uh, mainly because the system is going through acceptance testing as we speak. 
so they have a lot of things on their hand. But it's a fairly large modern bull system. Uh, it, it's a fairly decent storage system at the moment. It's only 20 petabytes only uh, at this point in time, but it will grow to more than 50 petabytes usable by the tail end of this year. And it will also continue growing over the next couple of years. So it's not the biggest file system, it's not the fastest file system, but it's going to be a very interesting file system because we will bring out a lot more of these new tools and test it at scale under production. And I think that is one of the important things with this slide, just to give you ideas. And one of the things that is really important, I mentioned earlier power measurements. One of the things that's really important in doing stats on a system is measuring live power. How much do we actually use over time? Because power is expensive. And especially when you have a system like DKRC, and I show you a picture of the building, which is in a <coughs> residential area, which is probably not the best place for a data center, but that's what they did. They have a power cap in the data center. So the fact that we can deliver about 20 petabytes into the system at less than 100 kilowatts, we think is kind of relevant. Unfortunately, we have to prove it over time. So that means that there needs to be an a very specific point of measurement in here. And I think that, if you look at the world today, is going becoming more and more prevalent. Well, not if you're Oak Ridge because you've got unlimited power at no cost, but the rest of us needs to be able to monitor a little bit. So, uh, this is just a list of everything, and just so you can see how many nodes it is. Uh, we actually have our DNEs at the end of the system, which is kind of counterintuitive, but that's how we did things. Doesn't really matter. So this is what an LTOP looks like when you just run the system. It'll give you the, the basic data, size of the file system, usable, etc., and then they start listing the OSSs, uh, sorry, MDSs, and then the OSSs after that. And again, I don't have a screen large enough to visualize all of that. So that's where the whole idea about filters come into. It. If I only do the OSTs, I get a list of the OSTs. I can fine grain down, <coughs> down to specific OSTs. I only wanted to look at OST 1, 8, 16, 32, and 48. I can do that with a simple script. And that means I can monitor uh, data placement, for instance, if I use an OST pool. I would rather be able to name that OST pool directly, but that's a future project. Um, <coughs> I can also do some other things. This is just monitoring. Metadata 1 with no summary of the file systems, so reduce what I print out on the screen, reduce what I look at so I don't get confused by too many data on a screen when I'm really only interested in certain numbers. I think that is another one of these changes that really will enable this tool to produce a little bit more relevant data when we actually monitor problem spots or hotspots in the system. Now, my intention was to do a live demo. But we all, we all know how it is with live demo that it's really difficult doing that, especially when the system currently is offline because they need to upgrade something in the system. So there will be no live demo, fortunately. However, we will try to uh, give you access to a recording of this if anyone is interested in what it actually looks like live. But an interesting thing for those of you who have never seen DKRZ, this is the building. And just to get you uh, the idea, you can see it is in a residential area. Uh, the data set is actually on the fourth floor. Go figure. And this nice thing around the system is not autistic embezzlement, sorry, not embezzlement, sorry, <laughs> embellishment of the house. Me no speak English very well, sorry. Um, that's actually a Faraday box because these guys are really afraid of cosmic radiation and all these other things, which unfortunately makes, may, makes cell phone reception in the data center really, really bad. But that's how they did the system. So um, what are the future plans for that? Well, this system is still very new. It is, I would call it the first prototypes we're doing now at a large scale. We've been developing for a while. But we want to get more, uh, more data into it. We also want to get more feedback from the community. Currently, there's only three sites that actually have access to this system. It is DKRZ, obviously. It is the CRACE system at uh, the British Med Office and a CRACE system at KAUST. Those are the only three sites currently that have access to this tool. But all three of those sites are large sites, complicated sites with a lot of requirements. 
And we are hoping that can give some good feedback to the system. But we are looking for input from the general community as well. And, um, well, that's pretty much it. I think I saved us a little bit of time, or at least tried to. Questions? Comments? Frank, Frank, Frank does get to answer questions. I'm not qualified? Okay. Uh, you can. <laughs> Is this a, 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 a command line only tool? Well, the back end is command line only, but the export function and the API is intended so that it can interact directly with a graphical tool of any and all kinds. So that's kind of the be benefit there. We did not want to slap a GUI onto the tool and then find out that half of the people, three quarters of the people that want to use this tool don't like that particular graphical user interface and want to use something else. So I think that having an open back end is more important than uh, you know, doing a one size fits all. I, I, may, uh, I may have missed that point during your presentation, but initially you said um, that a key, uh, key item is you, you basically put all that out to uh, put into a database, right? Yes. Yeah. And, and, and that gives you this superb, let's say, latency access and and do all kinds of analysis that's not possible in a sequential way is that right i'm not even sure i understood so that question yeah, yeah, yeah you know but normally when you run tools i have yeah. seen this you know in my previous life um, people dump immense data in the sequential file right. and then try to filter the information they're interested in you do this initially in you put it in initially in a structured way into an SQL database, yes. is that right? Yes. Okay, and that, that is the hidden advantage of your approach, or one of those. I, I would say that's one of them, yes, because okay. that means that you can develop either your own extraction tools from MySQL uh, to extract the data you're interested in, or use the API so that you don't have to do all that MySQL scripting, instead you just use the export API. So I'm curious, and I apologize if I missed it, but um, you essentially described the data acquisition as uh, sparse data being provided by lots of clients back to a central server. Yes. Um, what provisions are in place to disambiguate it between a client that's unable to communicate due to network issues or has in fact panicked or is completely faulted uh, and therefore is not reporting versus one that just doesn't need to update because there's no change? So. Um there is a heartbeat between the client and the uh, server at, at, at given times. There's also, at least in the, the configuration we use, we have uh, multiple networks. We've got a redundant management network, and if one doesn't respond, the other one will. If the node is actually down, obviously we have a bigger problem because it's not producing any data at all. That means it's also not working at all. So in those cases, it would be um, kind of a moot point. Uh, the client is actually capable of caching a lot of the data it does before it uploads it. So if there's any delay in sending it to the server, it will wait until it has full access to that server again to be able to dump the data upstream. So the, the, the idea is that we will not lose any data even though we have a congested network or a network failure for any reasons. So you described um, the client being down as essentially a moot point, uh, but if you're doing analysis, of course, uh, live, hopefully you've got some kind of a monitoring system and you're doing notification, you're taking care of it. But uh, you're talking about three years later going back and looking at data. Yeah. Um, is that information tied into the database in any yes. way? So, so, so what I tried to uh, explain in the first slide is that in addition to just performance data, we want to me measure health data on hardware and software nodes and everything else that is timed into the same database. That means we can have a, a lack of data or a problem with the hardware being <coughs> reported in the same manner as the performance data. So you would be able to have a, rel a, a you would have be able to do a, um, a correlation between the data that you have and hardware problems in the system. Okay, thank you. So on, on the uh, 
I think the last point in the last slide it said can, uh, people are thinking about about what to do with this tool and releasing it. Now, does that mean releasing as a Seagate product or releasing as an open source tool? Um, I'm Canadian. I can't answer that question, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> sorry. Um, had it been up to me, I would have said, yes, we will open source it immediately and get it out. Now, I'm part of a, I'm a small wheel in a large organization where I have people with much higher pay grade than Miami that makes the policies. I would believe that the intention is to open source this tool once it's vetted and works well. Um, the decision is not mine to be made, uh, but we will keep the community updated on when and how we will do that. The biggest problem we have with some of these tools is when do you release it? When it's fully fledged and everything is in there, which means that there may be not a lot of feedback from the community to do. Do you do it when it's half-baked, which means that it may not actually do what you want it to do, and then you get into uh, a lot of changes, and that delays the total roadmap of actually delivering a final 1.0 version of the system. There is a lot of aspects in there. So, <clears throat> you know, the honest answer is I don't know when. Uh, I would like to say not that far out, and I would also like to say um, Yes, it's, it's going to happen, but I cannot make that commitment today. Um, but as I said, our, we, we, we are working on it currently. We're working with partners, uh, you know, mainly Cray and Bull in this case, but we're also working with end customers to take it to the next level. Once that's done, you know, I, I hope I have a better answer. But at this point in time, that's the best I can say. Mm, thanks. Anyone else? Okay, so uh, let's give uh, Torben the Canadian Viking a big round of applause.